the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. What's the most important part of your day? Nutritionists might say it's to have a good breakfast, and I apologize for mentioning breakfast to those who are fasting this morning. Uh, perhaps it's time engaged with other people, friends and family, or maybe your work where you do some good for society. Some might say time that I can just have by myself to unwind and relax. Now these are all good things, but Abbot Triffin of the All Merciful Savior Monastery in the US makes clear what should be the most important part of our day, and that is communion with Christ. Now he doesn't mean having the Eucharist every day, but what he means is placing ourselves in Christ's presence and letting this be the life-giving spring, the daily bread, the source, the root, and the foundation for each day. Encountering Christ is what heals the man in the gospel, and encountering him is what will help us to keep to St. Paul's instructions in the epistle. So let's go a little bit further into this idea of having daily communion with Christ. St. Theophan the Recluse speaks of an inner communion that we can have. He says, communion with the Lord through the sacrament of flesh and blood is possible only at definite times according to one's possibilities and zeal, but never more than once a day. But inner communion with the Lord in the spirit is possible every hour and every minute, that is through his grace. It is possible to be in constant intercourse with him. It is in this way that it takes place in the times between making communion with him through the holy mysteries. But it can also be unceasing in a person who keeps his heart pure and his attention and feeling constantly directed towards the Lord. So in our church, we have much that helps us to maintain this inner communion, helps us to firm up our spiritual presence each day. Things like having a daily prayer rule consisting of morning and evening prayer, reading the scriptures, reading the lives and the writings of the saints, keeping our hearts and attention on God throughout the day using something like the Jesus prayer and following the commandments of Christ. But let's ask ourselves, how much do we really invest in these actions? In the Old Testament, God commanded his people to offer the first fruits of an offering to him. The choicest parts is the prayer the spiritual reading and other things that we do offered from the choicest parts of our day and the, the first fruits of ourselves? Or is it merely snatched at or done in a cursory or a rushed manner or shoved off to the tail end of the day? Are these things the first things to be jettisoned when we're too busy? Are they something that we're always intending but never quite accomplishing? And we might have a variety of excuses why we can't do these kinds of things throughout our day, and many of them have to do with being really busy. The key is to do something, but to do it with attention, do it with excellence. Some people will be able to manage 20 minutes or more of prayer in the morning and evening with reading of various kinds. Some people, perhaps just five or 10 minutes. For some people, maybe just one or two minutes. The idea is to do what you can, but do something rather than nothing. And do it with warmth of heart and feeling. It might just be reading one line of the scriptures, one line of the writings of the saints. But I do get it. Sometimes in life it just really is hard, especially at particularly pressing moments. There is another way of communing with God, however, which Saint Isaac of Nineveh explains in his first ascetical homily. He says, do you wish to commune with God by receiving a perception of that delight which is not enslaved to the senses? Pursue mercy. For when something that is like unto God is found in you, then that holy beauty is depicted by him. For the whole sum of the deeds of mercy immediately bring the soul into communion with the unity of the glory of the Godhead's splendor. The whole sum of the deeds of mercy immediately bring the soul into communion with the unity of the glory of the Godhead's splendor. And here is where we look to the first part of the epistle today, where St. Paul lists the gifts that have been given to the church. And he says, let us use them. And he says, and this is in the ESV 
Translation, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who gives aid with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Now, in different places of the New Testament, he lists different gifts too, like in 1 Corinthians 12 and in Ephesians 4, adding other gifts not listed here. But we notice that among all these gifts, they are all outward focused. We don't use these gifts to serve ourselves, but to build up the community of faith and build up the people around us. So these are like the deeds of mercy mentioned by St. Isaac. We are told to do all things as unto the Lord in Colossians 3. So when we serve others in the way that St. Paul says, we are able to do them as unto God himself. In short, these gifts become the very means by which in serving one another, we can commune with Christ, which is quite an incredible thought. So how can you contribute to this community and in doing so find Christ himself in your blessed service? Encountering Christ is what enables us to show the type of zeal and love that St. Paul speaks about in the remainder of the epistle. When we look at this part, we find a lengthy accumulation of exhortations and commands. Now, this is part of a letter in the ancient world called the uh, Paraenesis, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And this is a feature of many of St. Paul's letters, especially towards the end, this list of moral Reminders, which comes in quick fire succession. And their close linking indicates a certain fervor, a certain warmth of heart in St. Paul. He's embodying the very qualities that he seeks to increase in his hearers, this glow of the Spirit. It's like a pep talk given by a coach, words that, that lead us to true life. Now, whose voice are we listening to here? that of St. Paul and what he tells us in this reading and others, or one of the many other voices uh, alive and well in our world today. There are many confused, con- confused voices and messages out uh, now, especially in this time of wars, of climate emergencies, disasters, no end to the variants of the coronavirus, and even new diseases, as if COVID wasn't enough. These voices offer a myriad of different things. Denial, dead ends, hopelessness, despair, wishful thinking, useless solutions, or fear. Or in the face of it all, entertainment, distraction, and increased consumerism. A few days ago, I read an article in the Guardian newspaper that says Australians are spending more than ever on entertainment in uh, in what is now a $45 billion industry. Over 80% of households will pay for a streaming service by the end of this year, and households are spending a total of $4,500 a year on internet, subscription TV, gaming, social gaming, cinema, news media, podcasting, books, magazines, music, and live events. Now, don't get me wrong, there's nothing bad with any of these things, but that's a lot of messages entering our lives. That's a lot of voices that can dilute our spiritual presence. Once I had some friends over and they wanted to cook a special dish. They had some black truffles, right? Like, you know, like the the fanciest fungi you'll ever come across. They wanted to cook a pasta dish with these black truffles. So out came the truffles, they got grated down. Out came the other ingredients too. The cream, the butter, the garlic, the cheese. I'm speaking about food again, I apologize. And by the time we combined all the different ingredients into this pasta dish and tasted it, it was like, where's the truffle flavor, right? They had been totally swamped by all these other strong flavors in this dish. And this is a bit like our spiritual lives, right? We might grab out a little bit of prayer here, read a little bit of scripture here, Remember God maybe barely throughout the day, and then comes all the noise, and then come all the voices, all the opinions, all the content on demand, all the quickly changing ads, all the 
endless scrolling. And no wonder then our prayer is weak. And no wonder we feel distant from God. And no wonder we see the lives of the saints as something utterly alien and foreign to us. What is setting the tone in our homes? What is setting the tone in our minds and in our hearts? When was the last time we paid attention to what we allow into our spaces, unfiltered? Are these voices really influencing us more than that of the scriptures and the saints and what we find in our church? Do meaningless and sensationalized TV shows, songs, movies, and books clutter our minds more than quality literature, films, and music that lift the soul and promote the good and the beautiful? These words of St. Paul, the words of the prayers of the church, the words of Christ himself, the words of other good books should be what set the tone for us in our homes and in our minds. This world needs people who are marching to the beat of a different drum. And this is where I believe that as Christians we can embody the icon of the resurrection. And go and take a look at it if uh, you can't remember what it looks like. But in this icon, Christ is pulling up Adam and Eve out of Hades as he rises from the dead. And when we unite ourselves in practical ways each day to Christ, we can take part in this lifting up as well. And this is what the friends of the paralytic did in the gospel today, in bringing the man to Christ. When we do acts of mercy with cheerfulness, or love one another with brotherly affection, we lift up those around us who might be self-obsessed or inwardly focused. When we don't flag in zeal, or are patient in tribulation, or constant in prayer, we lift up those around us whose faith has grown cold, and who despair at the situation of the world. When we bless those who persecute us and do not curse them, we lift up those around us above petty complaining and gossiping and help them to avoid judgment. And living this life by God's grace has a mystical dimension to it too. St. Sophroni of Essex in his writings on the life of St. Silouan of Mount Athos writes that there are people who do not understand the greatness of religious deeds that spring from their roots in originate divine being. He says that rather than these spiritual states being a subjective experience that vanish as soon as they're over, or as soon as we're not aware of them, rather, he says, they have eternal ontological significance, that is, on the level of being itself. He experienced prayer, that is, St. Silouan, experienced prayer for enemies and the whole world as eternal life, as divine action in the soul of man, as uncreated grace and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so long as the world apprehends this gift, so will it continue to exist. But once among the multitude of men on earth there are no more bearers, even isolated individuals of this grace, then the history of the world will be over, and no human science or culture will be able to avert catastrophe. So in short, our connection with God is anchoring and preserving the whole world. To conclude, Christ says that the water he gives will become a spring welling up to eternal life and nothing else that we can connect to on a daily basis can grant us this too. We can have access to this water, this life, and irrigate the world with it. The spiritual state of modern society is not so much a barren wasteland as it is an overflowing landfill bursting with all manner of parasitic distractions that threaten to take the best part of us every day for the rest of our lives, threaten to take the first fruits, the best of our hearts, our attention, our our time that should be given to God and offered in prayer for the whole world. Because if we're not communing with Christ, we are most certainly communing with something else. And here is perhaps a good reminder, if you haven't yet read the newsletter, the most recent one, Father Jeff's words on idolatry. I heartily recommend you go back and reflect on those challenging words there. But let's be the people of the pushback, the people who have resolved to make communion with God the firm foundation of every day in prayer, in attention, in desire, and in service and love for others. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Unconquerable trophy of the true faith.
to you.